Hi, this is Nathan. We're just getting ready for a time of humor, excitement, and analysis. So why don't you get the whole family together and join us for another episode of the Mod Fam Chalk Pod. Hello and welcome to the Wadfam Chalk Pod. I'm Dylan Weaver. And I'm Andrew Sabo. And we are joined this week by a very special guest. This is where I say my name. This yes. is where you say my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, this is Arthur. <laughs> uh, so uh yeah. Arthur Woods joining joining us in the in the studio for an episode. I'm pumped. I I I know little to nothing about Adventures in Odyssey, but I'm thrilled to be here with you guys. Which is fascinating because you were a youth pastor yeah but i'm old Andrew. but, but that doesn't old. but like did you i mean you you were my youth pastor and i liked adventures and odyssey there was never a part of you that was like these children talk about this thing yeah but the teenagers that's, didn't that's typically it was fair. for little kids as as i understood it anyway well yeah we unfortunately didn't grow out of that no. but uh <laughs> I think we're well outside <laughs> yeah. the demographic at this point. <laughs> the target demographic. <laughs> Although I feel like Odyssey at this point has two demographics, which is like the people in their 20s and 30s and then like actual children. <laughs> and there's really nobody in between. It's just the people that came back to it because they got into podcasts. And oh, no, I'm just describing myself now. Anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, it's good to be here. Yeah, good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you want to just... Tell everyone a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then also what your history is with Odyssey. Yeah, well, I can easily tell you my history with Odyssey. That uh, <laughs> that goes back at least 24 minutes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, I was, uh, as Andrew said, I was a youth pastor, and I had the fortune of being the youth pastor to both of you guys for yeah. several years. And then... Uh, Fortune's a strong word. Yeah, it was it was a blessing. It was a privilege. Not always easy, but uh, it was good. And then uh, when I left that position, I uh, began speaking and teaching and doing some writing, a lot on the the subject of orphan care and adoption and foster care and that kind of thing. And uh, Dylan approached me not that long ago and said, "Hey, we got a couple episodes of Adventures in Odyssey that that kind of have to deal with this subject. Is that something you might want to jump on a podcast with us and talk about?" And said absolutely so mm-hmm. i'd never i have been hearing about adventures in odyssey my well maybe not in my entire life but your entire mm-hmm. life i've been hearing about it <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> and uh never listened to an episode and so uh dylan gave me a few starter episodes to uh to listen oh, to did? so okay, i did okay, okay. i did listen to a few for you know to get some context about the the series and then yeah can you share those what, what which ones were they I'm curious. um i set them up with sunday morning scramble because mm-hmm. i think it's a good introduction to the, the washington's, washington's in general and then oh i know what happens in the other one i sent you do you happen to remember what the name is what's what, what happens it's it's the so it's another episode it's the one where it's marvin and tamika and they are uh, marvin breaks uh the um the blender at Wit's oh, End. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. And they, they're going back and forth, but it, it sets up, right, so it gives more of the Washingtons, but also kind of, I felt like, sets up Wit's End, mm-hmm. also sets up some stuff with Connie's book, I believe, in that episode. So I was like, eh, that, that at least gives you a little bit of context. I completely forgot about Connie's book. I didn't realize that she did that. <laughs> Apparently 600 and something pages of it that I missed out on. 637 by the time it's deleted. <laughs> Now I want to know if it ever comes back. It's kind of a spoiler alert for me to know whether or not the book ever there reappears. No, yeah, yeah, there would have to be continuity in Odyssey for there to be spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. Um, okay. Well, now now you guys know a little bit about about Arthur Woods. Yeah. yeah. A person. What did you think, actually? Before we talk about the episode, I want to know what, what was your impression of Odyssey? Okay, I... That's a great to- question. <laughs> totally, totally legit. Absolutely loved it. Really? Because when I was when I was little, I actually grew up um, listening to radio programs. Yeah. I remember one in particular called Uncle Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> 
sounds creepy now, yeah, but back yeah. then it seemed wholesome. it seemed cool and wholesome, and it probably was. But uh, so this was really like a flashback for me of actually sitting down and uh, closing my eyes and listening. Now I will admit, when I was was listening to one of the episodes, I fell asleep because I closed my eyes. So mm. I actually, when I woke up, I had to start the episode <laughs> over and keep my eyes open. Mm. But I don't think that was. Uh, the fault of the episode i think yeah. it's because i was laying down with my eyes closed <laughs> I, I <would laughs> andrew that. never falls asleep listening to odyssey so. no no that's never happened ever so certainly not a crux that i go back to when i'm not doing well <laughs> yeah but the ep- the episode we're talking about today the chosen one i don't think i, I can fall asleep to that yeah one. that was that that got me from the first 30 seconds i yeah. was like what are you guys asking me to listen to here <laughs> yeah. this is horrible i yeah. don't want to listen to this I, again, because I didn't, I mean, I have I know I've heard this one before, but I didn't really have a ton of memory of it going into it, and I certainly didn't remember how dark it gets yeah. right in the beginning. Yeah, it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right out of the gate. Get out yeah. of my house. Yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Yep. Uh, so, so the episode was written and directed by Marshall Younger, um, which I think is interesting because Marshall Younger is a foster parent. Oh, um, I thought you were going to say he was an orphan. No. Okay. <laughs> Why? I don't um, know. <laughs> and uh, I guess that's more relevant to next episode than this one. But eh, Arthur's here, so it's already kind of spoilers to where the story's headed. <laughs> um, uh, it first aired December 9th of 2006. It was on album 47, Into the Light, episode 10 on that album. Um, I. I'm not going to go through the the cast just because it's a lot of people who we haven't heard before and we're just doing two episodes to so to yeah. set all that up doesn't feel super relevant but I do think what is relevant to the episode is it is Christopher Deal's first episode on sound design okay um and he has continued up to re- um doing sound design on some of the very current episodes mm-hmm. of the show but also the sound design and engineering on this episode is so good yeah especially coming off that first scene that i think it's worth pointing out that this is his first time doing that with the show yeah no he definitely definitely holds us in there i'm 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 interested because i did notice that but i didn't like notice it notice it i just figured that this was one of those weird episodes of odyssey that just sounds different (laughs) but no it's because there's actually somebody there that hasn't done it before yep you know it's interesting too what you said that uh i just found out from when you said it that the uh the writer you said is a foster parent yeah Mm -hmm. when i was watching this episode i thought I i feel like whoever wrote this gets it Mm -hmm. there there are some nuanced things that we see in in kelly that i felt like this yeah. this person gets it. This person has worked with with kids from hard places before. Mm-hmm. When they did a, I mean, especially with, I thought Wit's reaction was stand up, and obviously Mr. Washington and all of that. But yeah. we'll we'll get into discussing that. Um, would you like to roll yeah. a promo? Oh, I was just going to establish for Arthur that that Andrew has a tradition of referring to the parents of characters by Mister and then their last name yeah. rather than just calling him Ed. Oh, yeah. okay. You want to be formal and respectful. I, it's true. It's true. They are my superiors. <laughs> he does it every time, whether he wants to or not. <laughs> it's because it's easier to write Mister than it is to try and figure out what their first name is if I don't know it off the tip. Because I don't know if I would call him Dale Jacobs. Just, I mean, I just write Mr. Jacobs. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll the promo now. Um, we can get into it. On the next Adventures in Odyssey, there's a mysterious new girl in town. What in the world? She she seems so sweet. She does. She plays piano, helps Connie with her book. She even gives Ed solid parenting advice. But you, why why did you do it? What did she do? And where is she from? Meet Kelly on the next Adventures in Odyssey. That's a good can, turn. Can can I take issue with that promo there for a yeah. second? We always do. That's yeah, why yeah. we play the promo. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but I have I have watched this, listened to this episode twice now. I don't believe Kelly actually helped Connie with the book. No, she offered to help. Connie said no, and then. She gave. She magically gave got ideas. deleted. There was the idea of embellishing things and 
She told her to lie, essentially. Sure, sure okay. So, oh, okay. <laughs> that right. was her com- uh, I withdraw my issue. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is uh, the the transition to the jaunty music there at the end. Yeah. Doesn't work. No. Um, and on top of that, I think it's just a fun dynamic of <laughs> the narrator of the promo responding to, to like things that characters said in the episode yeah. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> like, i don't think we've ever gotten that before no so. yeah it's comedic i love it though it definitely it's so weird yep and unlike most two-parters we got two separate promos for this one so you get to hear us talk about a promo next week as well yeah that that makes sense though because i feel like the difference between this episode next, as far as like setting and plot, is pretty, like yeah. It's not. It's not as though it was like a long episode that was split up. Like yeah. it does feel like each episode kind of operates on its own to some extent. Well, I haven't. I have not yet listened to the second part. I kind of made that creative decision. I was like, should yeah. I listen to the second one? I thought, You're I know. Uh, I did only because, like, a month ago when I was trying to set all this stuff up with Arthur and I wanted to make sure it actually went somewhere that seemed relevant. (laughs) Um, But I didn't when I was prepping for this episode. So it's kind to in my mind. I kind of wanted to have my my insights based on only part one. Mm -hmm. So when I listen to part two and next time we talk, I might have some very different insights. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, and that's that's typically how we go about it yeah. as well. So, you 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 made the correct creative choice. I you think. have chosen wisely. A <laughs> hundred points for Arthur. So the yes. episode begins Griffin if we're ready to do that. Uh, with I'm ready. Basically, Kelly making food alone in her house apartment situation, right? And uh, and then her mom comes home and essentially yells at her because she left the stove on um, and she made her mom eggs and her mom had been drinking, presumably. Mm-hmm. No, Even... explicitly. Well, did she say that she had that? Uh, Kelly assumed Kelly, that she was. Oh, I guess yeah, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. But Kelly says, like, did you have too much to drink? Yeah. Um, and parent coming home late at night. Yeah. You can well, put that, two and two together. So this is what I wasn't sure. So I pulled it as this is like the morning after and her mom was waking up oh no 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 this was they actually said this is one o'clock in the morning yeah. oh yeah okay yeah she wasn't mom, mom wasn't home i think the mom's name was laura yeah. yes laura wasn't name is laura home. laura wasn't home kelly was 10 years old by herself at one in the morning yeah you know making eggs eggs for mommy which Oof. yeah is really tough and like yeah, this episode, it hits really hard because of how intentional they were about developing different sides of Kelly's character. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, definitely the side that wants to be helpful, but also sees her role and kind of identity as being not a kid. Um, so, like, you see pretty much every time she's seeking positive attention in this episode, it's by doing something good. Like, I don't know that she's necessarily, like, smoking to get attention because her mom is like that. I think that that's probably because that's what she, like, that's how she learned to cope from her parents and because it was accessible to her and if she has a neglectful parent, then, um, she's not going to suffer any consequences. Uh, it made it really hard to listen to to hear stuff like this um because yeah alcoholism is no joke and this is the first time that i can think of that obviously really actually kind of shows it pretty straight up for the ugliness that it is yeah and i think they in just the quick whatever that was 30 seconds 60 seconds that of the intro i think they they kind of nailed it too because you know you you'd like to think oh what you know would a mother really leave her 10 year old daughter home alone and mm-hmm. unfortunately the answer is yes and that's that's the reality of of the situation for many of these kids that that mom and dad aren't around and they are forced to forced to be by themselves and figure out life by themselves and and so i think that's where we see Kelly has learned a lot just because she's had to be 
you know, she's had to grow up without, yeah. in a sense, without parents. Yeah. And it just, it is like the first 30 seconds or minute, whatever, whatever this intro is, does operate as kind of like its own short film in a way that's mm-hmm. like super effective. Um, I think right off the back, it starts with, it starts with just like, the sounds of i guess her mom getting home yeah, like, it's, like empty apartment sounds yeah and it was yeah it was one of those things where like off the top of this episode i was like oh the sound design is like really good and specific mm-hmm. um and yeah sets a sets a thing even though i apparently misinterpreted it um but you know what that's why we have multiple people listen um or maybe yeah. i misinterpreted it <laughs> i've learned over the years that when you and i disagree you're usually right oh I still haven't learned that lesson yet. With <laughs> As listeners to the podcast, yes, I'm no. sure are aware. Um, so yeah, how does that scene go on? So basically, what ends up happening is so mom comes home, is really mad at Kelly because Kelly seemingly well, she left the stove on, um, and the eggs are cold and whatever, and the mom just is not nice to her, and so she essentially kicks her out and it's like saying like, "No, I'm done." Like. This is the last straw basically painting Kelly out to be somebody that's only problematic, which made me remember, like, there's another episode of Adventures in Odyssey where the kid has, like, bad luck, like, permanently. Oh. Uh, Did we cover it? Yeah. It's one of the Twilight Zone episodes. No, no, it is, it's on uh, Connie and Joanne's road trip to DC. Yep. Um... Where they have that episode with the like girl who shows up and is unlucky, but she like ran away from home rather than being kicked out. And the yeah. episode ends with her mom like like showing up and being so thankful. Oh, being a to good find yeah, her. being a good mom. No, no, this is different. <laughs> but uh, but it definitely did remind me of that because I was wondering as to like what do I attribute all these bad things happening. Um, too, and I wasn't sure if it was like supposed to be supernatural or whatever. Um, but essentially, yeah, this scene establishes that Kelly gets kicked out and that she's being sent by her mom to go live with her dad who lives in Arizona or somewhere. Yeah, it's unclear. I think the mom's essentially just kicking her out and doesn't yeah. care yeah, where I, she lands. I, that was my interpretation yeah. as well. She, she mentioned going, you know, just go live with your father or whatever, right. but. Yeah. I don't believe Laura, the mom, made any effort to plan. I, I think when we flip to the next scene, Kelly's on a bus, and I think that was all Kelly. Yeah, like, it doesn't yeah. say, but I, I just got the impression that, like, Kelly left the house, and she just started figuring yeah. crap out. Yeah. Yeah. The, took uh, money to the, she offered to pay for... Oh, because she broke the pan, right? This is This is the other, like, little detail that I really like from this scene that goes a long way to kind of establish... The relationship between Kelly and her mother Laura is when so because of the pan being left on the stove and 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 the burning and whatnot, when Laura kind of being upset about that, Kelly offers to well I'll just like I, I'll buy you a new pan to try and smooth things over and I was mm-hmm. like that is a yeah that just really stuck out as like a, oh okay so this is what the relationship is mm-hmm. like. This how often have like right? How often have you, as a ten-year-old, screwed up and then offered to buy your mother something to fix it? Like that's just such a yeah. It speaks to a pretty specific dynamic. Yeah, yeah, but I think this isn't. I, I think in this particular case, Kelly isn't bluffing either. I think because no. of what she's been through, she has the resources to, you know, to get the money she needs to get to pay for the pan and and she has the resources to buy a bus ticket yeah. right yeah um which does she steal presumably i don't know well we don't at, at least i don't know yet yeah, who I stole the money either. out yeah. of the, the register out of yeah. the register yeah so i'm not making assumptions yet no, but neither am I. but we do know she's resourceful and maybe she like sells soap on Etsy or something. Like that's that. probably it. That was my <laughs> guess. <laughs> the classic ten year old soap. Uh, um, yeah, and so we then get a really nice musical transition of just mm-hmm. like me loving the score of this show and like specifically like this era, the like 
post post Novacom yeah. three album fifty just like really really solid solid musical score, um, and then we jump to uh, we jump to the bus driver mm-hmm. uh, kicking Kelly out. Um, I mean, kicking not kicking her strong. out, waking her up and yes. saying, "This is and your saying, stop." <laughs> I would say she's doing the nice thing rather than... Is, it's 4.30 in the morning. This is the end of the road. And it's Odyssey. Woohoo! And it's a... So if it's 4.30 in the morning, presumably she's from two hours away from Odyssey? Why do you say that? Oh, because it was 1 a.m. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking wow. she... Uh, Let's map this out. No. Yeah. Let's do some pin drops and a yeah. radius and see... Yeah. Just just guess wildly. Where's two hours worth of bus away from Odyssey? The uh, the thing that I think is super interesting is so um, the bus driver is being voiced by Maureen Davis, who also voiced Laura. Oh! And will voice the homeless woman. That's ironic. Oh. <laughs> interesting. So we're like... There's two- a lot of homeless people in Odyssey, apparently. We are two scenes into the episode, and we've and we're three characters in, but only two voice actors. Nice. And it's like an interesting thing of like her mom kicking her out, and then like the same actress voicing a bus driver who's nice to her. Yeah, and like, waking her up. <laughs> yeah, it's right. The bus driver feels way more maternal than yeah. Laura did. Um, but then they went and cast the same same actress. So she was going job. just anywhere. Like she was, she was. A, Small town girl going away, living in a lonely world. Oh my gosh! She she you took a two a.m. bus. <laughs> uh, yeah, I should have seen that one coming. Yeah. Well, well done, Andrew. Thanks. You know the interaction with with Kelly and the bus driver was was interesting because I think that the bus driver was offering to help Kelly, mm-hmm. and Kelly needed the help, but she refused it. And then the the last thing the bus driver said to her before she left Kelly at the what I guess was a bus terminal mm-hmm. was take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yeah, that's the message Kelly has gotten her entire life yep. to take care of yourself. And that's exactly what she did. She didn't embrace the help from the bus driver. She let the bus driver go. And then she just went to figure out what it looks like to take care of herself. Yeah. Well, and, and probably taking care of herself, not because she sees herself as something valuable, but because it's the only option she has. It's survival. Yeah. 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 Well, and you can't trust adults. Adults have left her down, Yeah, you know, let her down her entire life. Right. And she says the line of like, oh, I'm meeting my dad. It's fine. Yeah. And as a listener, I was... Like, there's not even a second Mm-mm. where I believe that no, is the that case. You knew that was a lie. Like, that's, yeah, immediately apparent. Um, no, nah, pun. Apparent. Oh, my gosh. You said it, not me. I was just calling it out. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> so, this is when we get uh, Mr. What's his first name? It's Ed. Ed Washington. You know Ed. how many letters Ed is compared to Mr. Washington? It's a full Washington less. Yeah, that's fair. It is, yeah, less writing, and that's a very good argument for me. <laughs> um, point is, they're at Wits End, and they're talking about uh, redecorating the train room. They Apparently, he put a piano in there yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like It sounds like an old harpsichord. Kind of. It doesn't no, sound like just a, a reg- regular regular piano. I think it was just an old timey attitude like, piano. Yeah, and up, uprighty. Well, because they're doing they're doing a western theme. Yeah, in the in the saloon. Yes. Ultimately, that was the sound effect that they could afford for the episode. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's the piano it was. But um, <laughs> they're already skipping on voice actors. What? <laughs> oh, I was just calling back to the fact that we had. Um. um and then so. Yeah, so Ed Ed has donated a bunch of toys um, from when he used to work at the as the toy man, um, <laughs> which, which I think is literally what that episode is called. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and he is currently where we're at with Ed is he is managing Wits End Connellsville, mm-hmm. um, but because it's been slow, uh, he's going to give Wit a hand here in the Wits End Odyssey. Um, can I can I just un- interrupt and say I. I... I was very surprised again for for what I guess is a kids and family show. I love the idea that they introduced franchising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like oh. there's t- 
two, at least two Wits ice cream, uh, Wits uh, yeah. and you, ice cream stores. That's impressive. You have no idea the the franchising the, stuff. The, we we covered it during like our first run of episodes. The whole like franchising of Wits End. Mm-hmm. It's like it gets. It's an arc. It it really is. It gets franchised by a like by another company that he later finds out is like owned by a company that he is at war with um Ooh, over yeah. like yeah mind wow. control essentially i love um, this show and so then he like purchases it out from under the like the Contract. company that has the franchise so like <laughs> it's not even just that the show acknowledges that there's a franchise it is like yeah, there's a there's a lot more that goes. Well, into that. and because for so long, like that's kind of the point where like there's only one wit's end, yep. you know, and so then making another one makes it weird because there's only one wit. How can he have two shops? Yeah, and that's where we get Ed Washington, mm, Mr. Washington, Mr. Mr. Ed Washington, Mr. Ed Washington, proprietor and <laughs> manager of Connellsville Wit's End. Maybe just Mr. Ed, Mr. Ed. <laughs> Ooh. Alan Young connection. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so then what we, oh, we just, we hear the, um, we hear the piano being played in the mm-hmm. train room. And Why like, do they put the piano, oh, I get it that that's the old timey room, but like, it doesn't make sense to put a piano in a train room f- for like looks when you have an actual like theater. No, I'm sure they have a. I'm sure they have a piano in the little theater as well. Already, okay. right? But this one is because yeah, it's like I didn't even know it worked. Like it's yeah. horribly out of tune. We just threw it in there because we're doing like an old west like saloon look, mm-hmm. and a piano is the staple of that. It makes perfect sense. It does. You're wrong. It does. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're done. Yeah. <laughs> Time out for Andrew. Yeah, this, this is an important... I told moment. you to record without me. I'm just saying. Uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah, we get it revealed that Kelly was the one playing the piano and that she is self-taught, um, having never actually had piano lessons. Um, or read music or right. anything. Yep. See, I wanted a little... Maybe it comes in Maybe it comes in the second episode, but I actually want a little more backstory on that. I. Mm. I would yeah. like to know how she became such a good mm-hmm. piano player beyond what she already said. Yeah, that would be... It's the magnets. Yeah, interesting. The magnets work really well. <laughs> it's the magnets. Oh, my gosh. She yeah. ate too many magnets as a child. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> so, so Wit then is like, oh, well, mm-hmm. you know, could I teach you some Western music and get you to play during the grand opening at the train room? She's like, well, I'm not that good. And Ed's like, you're better than my church pianist. Although she is 102. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know what? I feel like you shouldn't be comparing. Like, I, I think that that's enough of accomplishment in of itself to be 102 and still, you know, you being the able piano? to play the piano at all. That is pretty good. What, what I took a little issue with is, is they walk into this room. There's this 10-year-old girl playing piano. They have no idea who she is. They don't introduce and, themselves. They don't introduce themselves. <laughs> and the first question they ask is not... Where's your mom? Yeah. The first question is, will you come back and play for our event? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm okay. a contractor. Yeah. No. I'm interested in employing you. That is very fair. Yeah, no, that's that that was my thought as well. Just being like, there is this child. But but to to Kelly, you know, okay, adults are terrifying, but these adults are genuinely pretty wholesome coming across and pretty friendly. So that is uh, kind of an interesting moment because she didn't want anybody there, obviously. She was in the room playing the piano because she likes playing piano and she was alone. And so they just kind of insert themselves into the situation with no context. (laughs) Yeah. But I guess that is true, but the reality is she kind of inserted herself into their context yeah, like right. just kind of like is witch shop. there is a random girl playing the piano in the other room we have no idea who she is and by the way we're not going to try to find out either <laughs> no, 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 the no. whole episode we don't even ask like hey where are your parents by yeah. the way yeah well and it's it's also a thing of like they open the door to the train room as well like it's the, yeah. the train room is roped off 
because like they're redecorating it the door is closed like they have to enter this closed room <laughs> that is currently under renovation think about that yeah so that they can like come across a girl playing piano well and they don't really care about anything other than the what fact are you that doing she's playing here? piano well <laughs> Can you play I, piano for That's me? almost out of like, it almost feels more like a horror movie where like you're scared and you yeah. walk into a room and all of a sudden there's a little girl playing the piano. There's an orphan <laughs> child playing the piano hauntedly. I would scream and run out of the room. Nobody ever taught me how to play piano. I just kind of knew. <laughs> oh. I'm not sure that's quite the vibe they were going for. No, I don't think no, so. No, I don't. Turning Kelly into an all-powerful deity. Oh, man. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, we, we go from there to a uh, establishing scene with Connie and Eugene that's mm-hmm. just kind of whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Connie is three chapters away from finishing her book on Odyssey. Um, that's, you know, a mere 630 pages. Oh, and she's still considering talking about Mitch. Yeah. Is she going to talk about Mitch in three chapters? I don't know, but the the idea that she's 630 pages in and hasn't included Mitch, I think, is funny. Mm. Telling. No, I'm just thinking, like, how much stuff do you have to talk about Odyssey? I mean, at this point, 604 episodes worth, I guess. Yeah, but like, yeah. And Connie's is... long-winded, you know. <laughs> it's in her character. Yeah. Oh, man. It is... Yeah, it's a weird subplot. It is such a strange subplot, which is why when I forgot it and then remembered it, I was like, what is this? Uh, yeah, having not knowing any of the backstory of, of Connie's book, I actually found myself like completely uninterested every time yeah, that, yeah, that came yeah. out. Like, I don't care that this girl is writing a book. Yep. But then they did manage to presumably tie it into yeah. Kelly's story. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is also... This is your... Uh, this is our first scene in the episode with Eugene. Mm-hmm. Um, Arthur, what did you think of Eugene? He... I, I don't think I could be around that guy for five minutes. <laughs> does it help you to know that it's the same voice as Petrie from The Land Before Time? No, that doesn't, that doesn't help okay. at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I found his... Yeah, I found his presence in the in the in the entire story just kind of off-putting and didn't you know, maybe if I knew his character better I'd love him, but like you know, thinking Kelly is like some mutant teenager who was like trained at Professor Xavier's school yeah. for the gifted yeah, yeah. like, you know. <laughs> yeah. This is this is simultaneously the best Connie scene and the best Eugene scene in this episode because they become so unbearable by the end. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it it's, is, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. It's also like at this point in the show, Eugene is married. Mm-hmm. Like he's not just <laughs> These are adults pretty much. <laughs> and he he does I don't know if they put that in on purpose, but he does mention that in passing like he's like, "Oh, that's my wife." And I was like, "Oh, this dude's married?" <laughs> okay. I'd like to meet his wife. Uh, she she's quite nice but like it's just it's just a yeah it, this is such a weirdly juvenile episode for both Connie and Eugene yeah um in their reactions and they're they're characters who have been with the show from basically the beginning so we've seen them grow and evolve and regress over the years <laughs> just kind of depending on who's writing them but it's yeah. like at this point, like Eugene's in the middle of going through stuff with his father, who mm-hmm. he had lost, mm-hmm. and also um, like running a charity. Yeah, well, and still working Eugene sometimes at Wit's End. Mm-hmm. That's also a good point. Yeah, that Eugene grew up in the foster care system um, as well, because mm. um, yeah, which is didn't... again, which I find so strange that. One, so, like, homelessness isn't so weird in Odyssey that, like, you know, Kelly fighting somebody else for a bench. Like, there's more than one homeless person per park, okay? <laughs> so, there's there's enough of a population there that that's not weird and that they don't immediately question it. But they also don't question it at all? 
like at any point, like you were, we were talking about it earlier, like there is no point in time where they're like, where's this kid's mom? Yeah. Or like they don't even think about the fact that like maybe there's something, maybe the fact that we don't see the mom is ta- saying something. They've had troubled youths come into wit's end before. Ones that smoke too. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, not to not to jump the gun on the smoking thing, but so both of our previous ones that we've talked about. So Nick mm-hmm. um, is a Nick Mulligan is a is adopted mm-hmm. and smokes. Mm-hmm. And Tony. Oh yeah, Tony and Brianna. Tony was in a gang in Connellsville and smoking, and Wit considered adopting him. Yeah. So this is like. There's there's a weird, we and we we talked about it before with with Nick and Tony stuff, but like there's a weird thing with um, with Odyssey where it's like, well, like the one thing that we can get away with talking about of like children doing that is bad is like vandalism and smoking. <laughs> so just every yeah. every person that they want to explain is like is dealing with stuff and troubled either vandalizes smokes or both it it's kind of like a visual representation like it like smoking equals troubled youth like right. it's just i'm yeah. curious to see what data there is for like you know how young you are when you first start smoking as to like uh how much childhood trauma you have <laughs> And if, if it does make you more likely? Or if it's just a narrative device? Yeah, probably. Now, I, I would say if you're 10 years old and smoking, maybe li- maybe life happened. hasn't gone well yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't automatically think like, oh, you smoke, you're bad. Right. But Which if is you're, such a if powerful 10... image. Yeah, like, so the first time I ever smoked, I was 14. But I was, I had like gone through puberty. So I was probably about as tall as I am now. Maybe a little shorter. And uh, thinking about a 10-year-old smoking and then thinking about the fact that I was only four years older when I started definitely made me be like, whoa, that was a bad idea. I should not have done that. Yeah, but you also don't get the, like, it didn't seem like Kelly was in that bathroom, you know, trying, well, trying cigarettes for the first time. Like, like, it sounds like this has probably been part of her life for a while now. Yeah. You get yeah. home from first grade, you know. Um, and so, because ten, t- how old is ten grade wise? That's like third grade, fourth grade. Yeah, fourth or fourth or fifth, fourth. Yeah, yeah I don't think fifth. Probably yeah, four, third probably third, fourth. Third, that fourth, was fourth. um. So when did you say this episode aired? Because uh, this is another two thousand six. Okay, so I feel like. Shows talked about smoking a lot more in that era because I remember reading books where kids were smoking at a really young age too and being like thinking like, oh, I guess this is just a thing that kids do in another part of the world or in a world that I don't live in. And maybe that's true, but I'm wondering if the whole like, you know, because we have less smokers in general and the way that um, like vaping and stuff like that has kind of taken over what then that data looks like now as far as like what is today's 10 year old's equivalent of kelly smoking in a bathroom yeah so the question is like has new odyssey had anybody vape yet sure that's another question i wasn't talking about odyssey but yeah (laughs) has odyssey had anybody Uh, so anyways the whole reason that we're even talking about the smoking thing is because the fire alarm goes off. Yeah. Um, and the kids are all panicking, and Connie's like exited in an orderly fashion, and they continue panicking, which is good comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's and, Odyssey's go to, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And then Kelly explains that she bumped into the fire alarm, which is why it went off, um, and that this happens to her all the time, which really puts Eugene on edge. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, so she's made of magnets. Clearly, she doesn't trip them. But it is interesting. This is the, actually the second fire alarm she set off in the episode. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> yep. Because Right, because she set off the, the fire alarm and presumably sprinklers back in her mom's apartment yeah, at the yeah. beginning. Like, there's definitely, like, the sound of water coming down. Um, and so 
yeah, we, we then get transition music, which Kelly plays, which mm-hmm. I really love, of, like, normally they, like, cut out on the scene on music, come back in on different music, but when they come back in on the music, it's just Kelly playing. Yeah. And that, I I thought, was, was fun. Um, and it's at this point that uh, Ed gives Kelly a doll um, that has six sayings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't really talk so much about it, but, like, obviously, um, we mentioned that uh, Ed is the toy man. He used to work for a toy company. He has tons of toys and is giving them away. And he, as you mentioned, he gives it to um, Kelly. And Kelly's kind of hesitant about it. She's like, well, I don't really play with dolls anymore, um, but I have some younger cousins that would probably love it. And I genuinely believed her, which made the scene of her sitting on the mm-hmm. park bench playing with the doll later just like, <sighs> oh, it is yeah. so hard. It's a great, it's a great little interaction. I was just not expecting to, and which is my fault, I should say. I was not expecting to be sad on the episode about you know foster care, but like, yeah, yeah. it really got me. <laughs> what do you, it was, yeah. yeah, it was to me that was was probably the most emotional part of the episode because oh yeah she, i teared up she clearly wanted the doll but in her world you can't show desire you can't show want you can't let an adult know that you want or need something from them so she she'll take it but she'll give it to her cousin mm-hmm. and then we find you know she's laying on a park bench she's probably got got you know cuddling with this thing and then we hear the phrases yeah. And it's like, oh my gosh. And then the, the last phrase was, I'll oh. never leave you. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, you know, other than her parents, who knows how many people have left Kelly over the years. Or who met, how many people have said that to her. Like, yeah, like, and it was a lie. Or how many people have said to her, I want to be your friend yeah. in her life, you know. it's yeah. And we, we kind of got ahead of it. So um, Kelly and... Uh, Ed. I have him in my notes as Mr. Washington. I don't care what you say, <laughs> Andrew. You do. You edit this. Um, <laughs> anyway. So she she's writing her own music. So she's even more talented than we established. Right. Well, she doesn't... She's not literally writing, writing it, it, but she's, but she's composing she's, it in her head, I guess. She's improv... Yeah, yeah. she's improv Well, uh, she says it's not even done. So, like, it's, it's this thing that she's been working on. Yeah. Which, think is fun yeah and she wants ice cream so he goes to get her ice cream well she offers fudge marble yeah because that's her favorite which fudge marble does sound delicious as far as ice cream is concerned yeah Yeah. i've never had have have you had fudge marble ice cream i haven't i I suppose i would eat it if it was the only one available but i'd I'd rather go with mint chocolate chip but let's really unpack this for at least 20 or 30 minutes i think is probably what we need to do we need need to as well I am a mint chocolate chip fan, but we need, we need to really establish how her choice of fudge marble ties into her great childhood trauma. trauma. I think only, that's, that's only where we need to go with this. I think that's the thing. <laughs> Trouble kids smoke and eat fudge ripple or whatever it was. I mean, you know, after a long day, sometimes... I need a cigarette I mean, and some I mean, ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only two things oh, to bring me Lord. back. Newport menthol. <laughs> All right. Cigarette. All right. So it's at this point that uh, Wit, Wits and Connie are freaking out about the... Well, Connie's more freaking out. Wits pretty level-headed about the this new register um, and the fact that it's off by $65. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a new computerized register. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and Kelly was, had been playing with it earlier. And this then sets up for... Uh, for Eugene to be like, oh, well, none of the fire alarms had been pulled or jostled. So Kelly didn't set them off. Because, you know... She explained that she had bumped into it earlier right. and that she was she, Right. And I, I do I do love everyone in the episode, and especially Eugene, constantly jumping to, well, if this is... if like. Kelly's it's, not. If this is Kelly's fault, it's not something she's doing intentionally. That's exactly yeah, right. Yeah. I love that. They're so blindly optimistic about this child. She, she can't yeah. control this power she has. <laughs> right. She ate too many magnets. Yeah. And, 
And, right. And so this is where the insane theory that Eugene has that Kelly is a magnet uh, comes up. <laughs> Well, and Eugene doesn't even know that Kelly destroyed a far- frying pan. No, no. Right. So, <laughs> this is one instance. There's, there's more there's, fodder for dude, that there's, theory. There's two frying pans in this episode. Yeah. Because he holds one up to her head later. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. I forgot <laughs> she, about she, that. She's probably tearing up, like, having flashbacks. Oh, man. Um, completely unaware. Yeah. And then the, this is, yeah, this is, like, the the crux of, like... Yeah, the emotion of this episode with Kelly, her from a phone booth. Oh my gosh. Calling oh. home. Oh. I don't even want to talk about that. Yeah. And the answering machine message is like a very like cute kind of like it's Gilmore Girls esque yeah. mom and daughter yeah. just being charming. I loved that detail. I loved yeah. that they put that in there to say, you know what? There are times or there were times where they were mother and daughter and it was cute and it was fun. And we get to hear a 10 second, not even glimpse of that. And then your heart breaks hearing that. And then your heart breaks to hear, you know, hey, mom, I'm just going to let you know I'm okay in case you in case you were wondering. It's like, oh, jeez. Yeah. In case your mother was worried about where you were because she kicked you out. Like, yeah. Essentially, her reaching out, yeah, it was, ugh. And, but it's, you know, it's her mom. I should not have listened to this in public. It's, that was the mistake I made. It's it's her mom. It's her birth mom. Like, you just, you love your mom no matter what they've what Whoa. they've done. And, and she, Kelly loves her mom. Dad. Maybe mom He was might live hero. in Arizona or Oklahoma. You know, two places that are the same. Yeah, yeah. Like, right. like. Kelly and her mom maybe were really close for a little bit there. Oh, and maybe, you definitely get that vibe. Yeah, that like, Dad's, like, not been in the picture, and so they were just doing, like, the we're, like, yeah, I don't know, we're mom and daughter, but we're also kind of friends. The Gilmore's thing. Yes. Gil- Gilmore's, <laughs> Gilmore girl thing. Yep. Um, and, yeah, so she hangs up that kicks a snoring woman off the bench yeah um that snore courtesy of uh christopher deal the sound designer's son <laughs> nice. um, who he recorded snoring and inserted into this episode That's like great. like actually snoring yeah nice all uh, right made me i don't i don't know if it was actually snoring i shouldn't say that maybe the kid was faking a snore regardless it says that it was his son snore i don't know of too many children who like legitimately snore but anyways, all of that aside, um, she falls asleep pulling the cord on the doll. Yeah, and you hear the audio. And so, like, the if we're talking about the sound engineering, the newspaper crinkling on the bench, all of that was immaculate. It was so good. You could totally mm-hmm. envision it. The girl that she kicks off, which, one, ballsy move by a 10-year-old being like, this is my bench. Right. <laughs> I'm going to challenge this full-grown adult who's sleeping on it an interesting response by the full-grown adult who's just like oh okay my bad (laughs) goes goes away but like right where you could where she could have come into the scenario all timid and like asking to have the bench because her stuff is there she immediately asserts dominance and is Mm -hmm. like this is my bench that is my stuff you need to leave and the adult's like yeah okay (laughs) Yeah, and not to, you know, not to dig into this maybe too deep, but but she's had so much taken away from her, and it's and it's always been the adults that have taken it away from her. So this mm. adult woman's not taking her bench. Yeah, like this yeah. is oh. this is survival, and I'm gonna defend what is mine. Yep. Yeah. Um. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Our next our next scene is um, Ed telling Wit and Connie that he and his wife Elaine are going to go on vacation mm-hmm. and leave um, his his kids Marvin and Tamika home alone um, uh, because of something that Kelly, uh, Kelly said. said. Yeah, when the Kelly kids said, can like, handle more stuff than they think. Yes. That is, yeah, I thought it was interesting that the, the Washingtons fundamentally changed their entire philosophy of parenting. <laughs> 
because 10 year old Kelly said, Hey, kids can handle more than adults think they can. And they're like, Oh, I didn't know that. Let's, let's go on vacation. And then, she plays the piano well, so yeah. she must know what she's talking about. And then, and then Connie immediately undercuts it by being like, Oh, yeah, the one, the first time my parents left me alone. Oh, yeah, I wasn't a Christian at that point. Yeah. <laughs> To which I responded, I want to hear more about Connie's pre-Christian days. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, yeah. I, 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 feel like, I feel like if you want that sort of a story, go listen to stuff with Erica and Aubrey. Yeah, um, yeah. And understand how Odyssey handles um, uh, high school use. delinquents. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, then Tamika finds Kelly in the bathroom smoking. Um, because as we've established, if you're a troubled kid in Odyssey, you, you smoke. smoke. Yeah. And Kelly asserts that dominance again. Yeah, yep. yeah, like I'm gonna go to this ice cream parlor and lay up in the bathroom. Well, and then when Tamika's like, I'm gonna tell Mr. Whitaker, she's like, uh, no, you're not. I've been to juvenile detention for violent behavior. Which is interesting. Yeah, and no, I she completely don't... owns Tamika there. Yeah. And it's one of those things where it's like, the way Kelly says it, I'm not sure if we're supposed to take this as truth or not. I'm glad you're, you're, I'm yeah. glad you're looking into that. I have some thoughts. Because, yeah, because it doesn't, it's not immediately like, yeah, it's not immediately clear that like, this is something that actually happened and this might just be, yeah. Uh, maybe it happened, but I mean, it seems within her character to, instead of act negatively for positive you know, for attention to act positively. You know, you see cooking eggs, helping Connie with her book and all that. Going along with Eugene, putting a frying pan by her head. Like, she seems like she wants to be helpful. So. I, I think I, I went back and forth on, on this. Like, uh, did she really go to juvie? Did she, you know, and and she might be lying about it. But I think I think I landed on the side that she was telling the truth. Because... Your your average ten year old is not gonna use a phrase like um, violent behaviors and juvenile detention unless they have experience with hmm. those things. So I kind of felt like Kelly was putting out her legit credentials. Like this is what I've been through. This is what I've done. You know, yeah. you know, how, you know, what have you done? You know, yeah. not much. Well, especially uh, because in Odyssey. Yeah, yeah. Tamika is older too. There's probably a right. sense of like. I mean, even if Tamika's 14 or 15, which yeah. would be the upper end of how old she is, you yeah. know. That, I think that is, I think that is ballpark where she's at at this yeah. point, though. I think, I think it's, yeah, I think the idea is that her and Marvin are both teenagers at this point. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh. That's it's a, a scene. tough, yeah. It's like, a tough. Scene. Oh, and th- this is also this is the point at which it's established that Kelly is ten. Yeah, which mm-hmm. I think is like, yeah, is it interesting that they're established? Like that, yeah, that it's so clearly established, but like only at this point. Yeah, Cause, yeah, because she tells us she's ten, and then they they write it in to reiterate later on. I, I right. think I think Mr. Ed, Mr. Ed Washington, I think also <laughs> reminds us that she's ten at some point. Yeah. And it, yeah, because you, like, just from her her mannerisms and whatnot, like, I feel like we've definitely gotten that vibe throughout the episode that she's pre-teen, but the, the 10 thing still, like, hit. Like, oh, yeah. Yep. This is a 10-year-old, and it's also in the scene where she's doing, like, arguably the most adult thing she's done in the episode. Right. Or mm-hmm. the, I mean, kicking... Kicking someone off a, off a park bench is, is pretty adult. More adult, but like it, it's at the same time as being like this is like the, yeah, this is like the I don't know most destructive she's being, and we're also establishing that she is a ten year old. Yep, mm-hmm. and that we we see that so often in kids from hard places. They're mm-hmm. in many ways they're developmentally super super young, but from a. a a life skills standpoint or a streetwise standpoint, they are extremely old. So you, you have a kid that, you know, that, you know, maybe developmentally more like a five year old, um, but she has the life experiences of a 21 year old and, and knows things that no 10 year old should have. And so yeah. I, I think we see that Jekyll and Hyde fight in Kelly. I don't mm-hmm. think later on they get a little concerned that like Kelly is almost like fake with her 
her kindness like mm-hmm. oh she's she seemed nice but i guess she was just faking i don't think she's faking i think kelly is that that one side of her is extremely kind and polite and wants to be good and helpful and all that and then she has that other side of her that's going to fight for what is what is hers yeah there's the definitely the the nature versus nurture kind yeah. of situation going on and it's super common especially with children with um really you know uh unstable or unhealthy home lives to not to basically train themselves to not need anybody Mm -hmm. and it really you know even if even if it's not quite to this extent but if you have neglectful parents growing up or absentee parents growing up or whatever um yeah you you learn to basically trust nobody but yourself and you see trusting others as as a form of weakness you know, as a, as a way of vulnerability. Um, and I, yeah, it's, I've known people personally like that. I've experienced things personally like that. And it's, it's really, really hard to go against those kind of neuro pathways that you build up over time Mm -hmm. being like, these are, this is how I deal with problems. I figure it out on my own because that's the only person I can depend on. Yep. Yeah. Well, and that that thing you said, Arthur, about her being about the like developmentally younger while like having experienced more, I think the the doll hammers that home right. really well. Exactly. Because there is an extent to where even as a ten year old, having a doll where you pull the string and it says nice things to you is something that you have probably outgrown. Mm-hmm. But um so her right and to where andrew was like yeah i i I bought it that she didn't want it at first Mm -hmm. um you kind of get it because you're like yeah that is like a little kid's thing but then it's right it's establishing this like yeah even though she like puts up a tough face all of that yeah all the trauma and what she's been with has yeah made this such a yeah, something so important to her. Yeah, like when well, giving her something she doesn't get. Yeah, you see, even it if a it lot. does make her look like a child, acquiring like, something that maybe isn't necessarily inherently valuable, but because they can get it themselves, or is it's given to them and it's theirs, they, well, they do it. I I think that there's also an element to it of it is a thing that a person that a, an adult is giving her just out of pure kindness like it's not sure. there's no motivation for yeah. ed to give her this doll so in addition to like it being something she can snuggle up with that says nice things to her there's also a sentiment of like an adult like yeah an adult person in my life who i barely know cared about me enough to give me an item um yeah i think you're right uh so yeah. So <laughs> this is this is then the scene in which uh Kelly advises Connie on her book and Eugene uh is quizzing her about her relationship with metal <laughs> and it is it's a bad scene for both Kel or for both Connie and Eugene. Yeah. <laughs> Just um Eugene being completely oblivious to how ridiculous he's being connie calls him weird science man um which is fair um but then when kelly suggests that connie you know exaggerate things in her book do it more soap opera style or Mm -hmm. make like a listicle Mm -hmm. um and different things connie's like oh great ideas let me put you in the acknowledgments and when kelly is not cool with that connie doesn't care and keeps pushing her which is so hard to listen to (laughs) yeah where it's like dude like take a hint yeah like are are you random girl who you don't know at all shows up completely unaccompanied does not talk about where she is or where she's going and she's hesitant to share her name and you're insistent upon it oblivious right. to it's, everything it's the insistence that is so frustrating mm-hmm. if connie said it and then she didn't like anything and then kelly was just like oh like you know 
I, I'd rather not. And Connie could be Connie could be like, oh, that's odd, but just think nothing of it. Right. But instead, she like gets into a fight, pushes it with Kelly, and she's being so just like, oh yeah, it'll be like so fun, and like, oh, of course you'd want your name in a book. Like millions of people are gonna read this, which Eugene does a spit take on, which is kind of funny. But yeah, I did like that. You know, I think maybe Connie's first clue is the fact that. She doesn't know what Kelly's last name is. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even know this kid's last name. Yeah. You don't know anything about her, so... Uh, yeah. Maybe well, she, take it at face value. She doesn't want to be in your book. I'm wondering if they intentionally wrote Connie and Eugene that way as a sort of, like, allegory metaphor situation for, like, kind of the naivety of the church, maybe? I, I, it uh, seems I, like something that could be the case, or maybe that's uh, that's being too generous <laughs> I, I think I think you're stretching it okay. I think it's well I was thinking like these guys are people that notoriously will talk about taking care of people and loving everybody and you know um, yeah seeing the world and their lives as a missions field and who do they have but somebody that you know needs the love of Christ a lot at this current point in her life and and uh, and they're completely oblivious to it. Oblivious and towards the end take a antagonistic. Uh, mm-hmm. Take quite a turn. Yeah. Um, but I think if if you've never come from a hard place yourself, and or if you've never worked with or lived with kids from hard places, there's so much that you don't know that you do tend to. To skew a little bit negative, or at least skew highly naive in how you mm-hmm. in how you talk to those kids. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it's not it's not a scene that looks good for either Connie mm-hmm. or Eugene. Um, was it wrong that when we find out Connie's book got deleted, I was like, "Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Happy now." <laughs> I'm just waiting for it to... I mean, I don't remember what happens in part two, but if it is actually gone... Because they said it was deleted off the backups, too. It's gone, gone. If they bring it back, I'm going to be really mad. (laughs) Um, And so, yeah, our next scene is uh, in the kitchen at Wit's End, Mm -hmm. um, wherein they find out that all of the ice cream melted overnight. Um, The, uh, yeah... The the um the door locks magnetically, which has Eugene. Um, it's an electrical <laughs> lock, magnets. <laughs> yeah, but then Ed, like a good and proper adult, recognizes that there is one tub of ice cream open, and it's fudge marble. And maybe that is a bigger clue than the lock being <laughs> and the lock being magnetic. <laughs> And they, they do make sure they set the table for the fact that Wit said he locked it, and then I, I think it was Connie or someone yeah. someone Connie. said, oh, yeah, and I double-checked it. So, like, there yeah. is no, like, well, maybe they forgot. No, yeah. it was locked. It was yeah. locked. So either the mutant powers over <laughs> overtook the lock or... Well, and Wit's like, I gotta, I gotta call the fridge company because, you know, something's not working here. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ed's like, wait a second, wait. I noticed something. Yeah, which, with how naive even Wit is, which is what got me to be like, maybe this kid is actually supernatural. <laughs> like, maybe she does have magnet powers. <laughs> or maybe you guys literally know nothing about her. Right. Yeah, you yeah, absolutely know her ga- her. You know her name is Kelly, and she plays the piano. Yeah. <laughs> well, right. let's show her the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? She wanted to see everything in the back. That, that's right. That's the whole reason she knew about the freezer. Oh, man. I mean, she presumably memorized the lock. Are we not going to address that part? Oh, okay. Kelly. It is... Oh, man. So, yeah. So then... Then this is where Eugene, like... Tries to put a frying pan. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, he goes, may I put this frying pan next to your head? 
And she says, I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> yeah. Which, what does he think's going to happen? Like, there's no electrical switch that's going to go off on no, the No, but magnets. It's going to stick to her head. I don't know. He starts quizzing her. He's like, if you ever, like, go on, like, do you ever set off an airport metal detector? She's like, I've never been on a plane. He's like, how about, a, how about an 10. electronic keyboard? He's like, no. It's like. <laughs> I've always wanted to use one. Oh, man. But this, was this was this, this the is scene really when, uncomfortable? The whole, the whole thing was that whole plot line oh, was uncomfortable. But so bad. was this the the scene when so he's got the frying pan up to Kelly's head? Was this when Connie says like, "Oh, just let him do it. It's fine." <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if it was that scene or earlier, but I'm like Connie. Wait, like, wait, what? <laughs> I think she it might have been in the book writing it, scene. Okay, but, the, regardless. but regardless, she's like she's like sticking up for Eugene. Like, yeah. oh, just let, let him be crazy. And yeah. I, if I were Kelly, I'd be like, I don't know him, and I don't even know you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> call yeah. away. Because, yeah, it's, it's that point at which I, I believe Connie says, like, yeah, just let it happen. He's just being weird science man right. again. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, I don't want weird science man anywhere <laughs> near me. <laughs> well, then yeah. they're going to get in the car, right? Yeah, there's so that whole is, car situation, so, which is so that was, that was weird. Yeah, I, and he's like, really "You just ugly. don't think I'm pretty," and he's like, "No, you're pretty." Like, uh, yeah. or not those words right. exactly, but she's so, like, "I know I'm not right. very pretty," and he's like, "Oh, that's not it at all." And I'm like, "Please yeah. clarify that you don't think that this ten year old's attractive." So right, so the plot line that happens here is that Eugene wants to test out on an electronic keyboard, like a musical one. Um, to see what her powers do to that, and he wants to. He's gonna. He's like, we can walk to the music store. It's like a mile away. And she's like, well, don't you have a car we could take? And he's like, well, yes, but there's electronics. And so he's like, <laughs> he doesn't want to take the car. But also, he is a grown man, right? Who is like, he doesn't seem to have any. He's worried about the electronics of his car. He doesn't seem to have issue with the fact that he is a grown man driving a 10-year-old girl a mile, just the two of them. He does not know who her parents are, if she has parents, what her last name is. And he's all doing this for a science experiment that, like, he could use anything to, like, he doesn't need... The, there's nothing specific about the keyboard that makes this a better thing to test with. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's nothing true. at all. That's true. Um, and yeah, and so that's Wouldn't when, a blender or something? Right. I don't know. I thought Witson notoriously had a ton of electronics. It really does. Take her to the imagination station. Yeah. Like, so yeah. So there's this... Something that a child might enjoy rather than being put into a van and taken yeah. to a music store? It's... It's really, really uncomfortable, and yeah, I, I found it uncomfortable in both ways for the for the reasons you already said that like his his concern was more that she's a mutant with the ability to control metal, right. as opposed to I'm concerned that she's I'd be alone with a ten year old girl that I don't know. Right. But then Kelly was like oddly insistent upon driving with him. Right. Yeah. And I was like, what? Well, like, was this just simple? I don't want to walk a mile or is right. there like what how are we interpreting this here why is yeah, kelly so I, insistent i right i think the insistence is maybe just like you you said no and didn't give a good reason right yeah um children do but that quite a bit. but like oh it is yeah it's it's uncomfortable and then she does the right the Oh, I understand. You don't want to be seen in a car with me. You don't think I'm I'm pretty, and it's just like, oh boy, like, what are you doing? <laughs> right, and it's like, it, right, it's an opportunity for her to have a level of control over Eugene and kind of be right. manipulative in that way. And so, like, that's just how I'm reading it. But there's darker undertones. Yeah, uh, I. I... I mean, I don't know Adventures of Odyssey, so I don't know how often they go into some of these dark places. But I, so I did find the conversation hinting at some some darkness there. But even when she said, you know, it's it's because I'm not pretty, his response was, "No, it's not that." <laughs> yeah, it, that's what I was like. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, you're hideously ugly, but that's not the reason. Yeah. Like, he doesn't say, like, oh, no, you're pretty, you're beautiful. Yeah, like, but I also don't just, want that. No, I probably wouldn't either, but it's <laughs> no. just kind of like, he doesn't even, like, He's in a no-win situation. That is a no-win situation. That is that is true. Yeah, it's what do like, you do there? 
He, he probably just said the right thing. It's not that. I'm, it's, yeah, I, I'm not going to agree you're ugly. I'm not going to tell you you're pretty. Can we <laughs> can we move on? <laughs> Lord, please. You know, and Eugene, you're the one that got yourself into this mess. Yeah, that's right. fair. You're the one who's convinced that this person is magnetic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. So, uh, um, so then this is when we get uh, Tamika telling Ed, Mr. Washington, that... Uh, um, and wit about Kelly basically threatening her. Right. Well, and the fact that she was smoking in the bath in the bathroom. Yeah. Which then they're like, oh, that's what set off the alarm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, and then we hear Connie scream from another room. <laughs> yeah. Why, why did she scream? I don't remember. Because what... her book's erased. Oh, that's mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Connie well, screamed. Yeah. I laughed. <laughs> I guess I guess there was no sympathy. Yeah. I guess b- before before Connie's scream is is a little bit of this discussion where they're starting to put together the pieces of like, oh the because because the whole I guess Tamika had already told Ed about the smoking thing because he's because he's bringing up the the fudge ripple being the one container open and then is like Tamika can you tell Mister Whitaker what you told me mm-hmm. so she fills wit in on the on the smoking thing and so they're starting to be like okay. Like, what we saw with her is not necessarily what it appeared to be. And, and yeah, kind of, right, starting to maybe wonder, like, who is Kelly and what is going on here? Mm-hmm. And why has, like, the past two or three days that she's been hanging around our thing, we never questioned the fact that she was here from dusk till dawn yeah. and then went home and we never saw a parent and, yeah. All of that stuff is like. Well, and there are children that hang out at Wits End like that. Yeah, I know. but it's a small town. Everyone's very trusting. Yeah, but still, she's yeah. ten. She is ten. Like, arguably not old enough to be left alone. Right. In like the house, you know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Connie screams. Her book is gone. Boo hoo. Yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah, and then they they they're like, okay, the files are gone, and just off that, and and off that, so someone like those are the only files missing. So it wasn't because Eugene's immediately like, magnets can disrupt, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can disrupt files, but nothing else is gone. And so then they're like, okay, it was intentionally deleted. And Connie's <laughs> like, and Connie's like, oh, like. Kelly was being so like cagey yesterday. I'm like, oh, you picked up on the fact that she was being cagey? Why'd you keep pressing her? <laughs> like you can't claim naivete if you're also going to Love say it. if you're also aware of the fact that she was on edge. It's like then why in the world did you press it? Maybe she <laughs> had some regrets when laying in bed that night. <laughs> I'm choosing to believe the best about Connie that she was stupid oh. in the moment and then felt bad about it later, but I did appreciate the detail of them also letting us know that it was deleted off the backups. Backup as well. Because I think if they hadn't mentioned that, I know at least the three of us would have said, you wrote 600 and however many (laughs) pages and you didn't back it up? Uh, Are you insane? (laughs) So that just got that argument and threw it right out the window. No, it's it's all gone. Right, and it's 2007, so we're in a pre-Google Docs era wherein documents can be deleted. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my my honest hope is, I mean, we've been down on Eugene a lot. I really hope that in, in part two, it turns out Kelly really is a mutant with yeah. <laughs> a, a, the ability to control metal. That's really what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Yeah, because if, if she's got her powers honed in enough, she could conceivably delete just a couple files. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. That's exactly um, right. And so I think like, we're going to see that in the next yeah, episode. I, that really seems like this is the time for Odyssey to take a supernatural turn into, like, comic book stuff. Yep. Um, this is this is X Men origin stuff right here, exactly. and I think that's that's clearly the direction they'll be headed in the next episode. Yep. Yeah. yeah, she is Magneto's daughter. Yeah, dun, oh. dun, dun. see, I didn't. Wait, she's related to Palpatine too. <laughs> there is there's some kind of I I'll be honest when I was listening to the episode, and Kelly first came onto the scene, which is really the, the first scene. I felt like like the presence of a Sith. Like, yeah, I yeah, just yeah, yeah, felt yeah. like a Sith Lord had just mm. appeared, and I, I think, and I couldn't shake that the entire episode, so. There's always two. Yep. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there's, 
I don't know if I'm replying to mom or Where did we? Yeah, where did we go with that? Oh, man. Darth Kelly? Uh, And so, then Kelly, in, in in the midst of them putting this together, in the midst of them putting this together, Kelly walks into the room and Connie loses mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. on her. And Kelly is extremely defensive, is just like, no, it wasn't me. I don't know why you would say that. And just like truly going off about it. But the Yeah, then the 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 moment is like everyone then also decides to jump on her. Which really bothered me. So in yeah. the previous scene, they're talking about like, okay, we need to confront Kelly. And so then this happens, and rather than them just kind of shutting Connie down and having a conversation with Kelly, they all start piling in in this way that is really, really overwhelming, and everyone's coming at it with so much intensity. And like wits being like, you know, hey, it's it's okay, we're going to get through this and whatnot, but everyone else is, like, being the louder voice. I disagree with you. Oh. Oh. I, okay. I noticed, I think Wit started the the gang up of Kelly. Now, in his defense, I think he's also the one that ended it. Mm-hmm. But when Eugene first came in and said, uh, I'm looking for Kelly, I kind of, I need to talk to her. Wit's response was, I think we all need to talk to her. And I remember hearing that thinking like, well, no, I don't think all, <laughs> I don't think Tamika and Eugene and Witt yeah. and Ed all suddenly need to confront this kid. And, and in some ways that's exactly what happened. And, well, and so in some ways it was, confrontation. yeah, Witt, Witt led that. Now I'll, yeah. maybe we'll get into it, but that he changes his heart mm-hmm. very quickly and, and says something that for me was the, the biggest take, take away the episode. But it is right. It's this frustrating thing of like, yeah, of just so many voices all, like, jumping on her. And, like, the loudest voices are the least mature voices. Are, mm-hmm. like, Connie and Eugene freaking mm-hmm. out. And not, like, the more well-reasoned Wit and and Ed. Um, even though, yeah, like you said, Wit does not start out in a great place mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Um, and and honestly, I'm sure it was probably really traumatic for Kelly with everything because yeah. my guess is she probably saw her parents doing that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And like, I, you know about like triangling and stuff like that. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, like, like you know, parents involving their kids in stuff is a big thing that happens all the time, whether you are aware of it or not. Um, and getting piled up on like that by strangers when most of your childhood was getting piled up on by your parents uh definitely definitely feeds into that insecurity that isolation and um that lack of trust and good point that to reestablish that these are strangers that's exactly right yeah like she has been there two maybe three days and the the episode does does an interesting thing to kind of be like every character in the episode is like individually wronged by Kelly. Like they Mm -hmm. all have Mm -hmm. something that's motivating this scene, whether it be Tamika getting threatened, Connie's book being deleted, Eugene's weird confusion about whatever the ice cream for Ed, like the, the it's the cash register for wit. Like every person kind of has their own thing to be mad about, but you expect the homeless want... woman to even jump in and <laughs> yeah, be like, yeah. I was sleeping my that was mine. <laughs> That's been my bench for three years. <laughs> but yeah, everyone just jumping on her is is so is so hard mm. to like listen to. And well and then she finally kind of breaks right. down yeah. which Right, where she's been kind of saying like, hey, like I'm not like this wasn't me and then at some point either wit or ed's like we got to talk to your parents and she's like no you cannot yeah. um and then yeah ends on the line of saying that that her mom beats her and then she runs away yeah if i go if you tell my mom or if i go home i will be beaten and so i'm not going to do that yep and you're not going to do that 
And I thought that was interesting because I think I think she was probably telling the truth. I think she was probably oh, beaten sure. by her mom. I mean, that seems consistent. But it was interesting that that she said, and if you tell my mom, I'll get beaten again. As if there's some level of, of hope or expectancy that she is going home. Mm-hmm. I mean, if she was really away from home for good, if this was like, you know, a permanent thing, calling mom's not even an option. Being beaten by mom's not even an option. I'm not... You know, I'm not with my mom anymore. Mm-hmm. But it was almost like in her head, there was part of her that was, I don't even, maybe not hope is the word, but mm-hmm. thinking that inevitability that I am going to end up back home again and I will be beaten by my mom again. Yeah. Well, and definitely getting, having this be the reason that gets it, her mom back involved. Yeah. Right. You know, um, I mean, her mom was obviously super upset, even though when she was doing something with good intentions, whereas this, could be seen as you know much more malicious you know there's obviously robbery and you know she's smoking and like legitimate reasons to be mad at your child um other than like they left the stove on and broke a pan you mm-hmm. know yeah but i think i think that idea that she is expecting to return is kind of consistent with the episode where it's not that kelly chose to run away like she was kicked out Mm -hmm. um which is whereas if she had if she had left a bad situation of her own volition i could understand her not feeling like oh that's something i'm going back to but the fact that like she was forced like she was just forced out but like and we get from the phone call of like her checking in kind of this thing of like it's not me abandoning the situation mm-hmm. like i was forced out and i'm gonna go back which then yeah this goes on to yeah play with that with the idea of like hey if i if i go back and she knows about all this like things are not gonna go well for me mm-hmm. yeah and i think that's a great point too because you know if if laura if kelly's mom laura suddenly showed up on the scene and said um sorry kelly let's let's go home Kelly would have jumped in the car, I think, immediately and gone mm-hmm. home. So I do think there is that expectancy that she is going to go home at some point. And, and I don't know how this plays out in episode two or, or beyond. So I don't, you know, whether or not she goes home, I don't even know yet. But yeah, but yeah and there's there's also a thing where it's like, uh, aside from like the, the, the juvenile detention thing um, that is likely true, but possibly not, we don't really have it's not really established that her and her mom have like spent time apart. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't feel like she's been bounced from house to house at this point. Like we don't even, even going back to the voicemail message um, and kind of the intimacy of that, I feel like there is kind of a, like things have not been good, but at least like, the mother and daughter are still together yeah Mm -hmm. up until this point and now things have broken whereas like yeah there she would maybe be coming at things with a different attitude if she had been bounced around a bunch and didn't have right this kind of established relationship with with her mom yeah i would and you know as much as we talk about you know the characters and how frustrating they can be i think that um not not shifting blame of oh she's just being dramatic here is really important and good and like validating what she's saying and experiencing because if if I have you know there's you obviously always choose to believe the victim if somebody ever confesses anything um, but there's always the thought in your mind where it's like okay if she is a 10 year old kid there are 10 year old kids that lie and have mental health issues that use manipulation as a form of getting things and i'm really she's um, definitely been manipulative yeah Mm -hmm. and she's definitely been super manipulative and that's why when i was kind of tracking through the thing that i made this episode so hard for me was that like i couldn't just chalk it up to the fact that maybe this kid has bipolar or borderline or something like that you know, like, no, this is, 
very much like you said, like a like a Jekyll and Hyde. This kid is wrestling with two very uh, opposing forces of yeah. desire in her life, um, and I'm glad that the episode took the tone of sympathizing with with the victim rather than saying you know rather than deval that uh, delegitimizing her claim Mm -hmm. very much so and that's yeah that's where this part one of this episode leaves us which is uh, (sighs) a tough yeah a, a, a tough ending note um it's probably the toughest ending other than, like, Mitch is dead. <laughs> that I can think of. Well, I think... Yeah. I, I actually liked the way it ended because I do think... Uh, even though I do think Wit maybe early on was a little responsible for the gang up on Kelly. For me, this is what I alluded to earlier, there, there was one kind of overall takeaway, and it is something Wit said at the end. And he was he was talking to the group about Kelly, and he said, don't confront her too harshly um there is more to her story Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. and i think if if there's any takeaway for any of us or any of anyone listening is we don't know people's stories Mm -hmm. and all we you know we might see behaviors we might see outward um signs of 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 whatever but we have no idea what they've been through We, we don't know the why behind their behavior and you know i think if you you know, just to keep it in this story, if you were to really start knowing everything about Kelly's, you know, background, or or even a little bit we do know about Kelly's background, you end up saying, well, of course this is, yeah, this this is how she is right now. Of course she is. Um, so I just thought that was that was just great advice, even in the real world. Like, don't judge people. You just don't know what their their story is. Yeah. yeah. Well, and don't assume that the things that they did that hurt you were malicious. Mm-hmm. You know, like like they were intending to hurt you. Um, you know, well, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people hurt people on accident because they themselves are really hurting. And I would say that that is where Kelly has fallen this episode. You know, she got scared, obviously, so she threatened Tamika, and she was experienced a lot of neglect and um, apparently abuse and you know was hungry so you needed a place to stay like she was entirely rely- you know relying on herself and that's why you see her behaving in such um, aggressive ways that are sometimes destructive yeah yeah and I think you're I think you're spot on there in terms of us judging what the person's motivations are like yeah I, I guess we still don't know who who took the money out of the register if money was even taken out of the register but just assume for a second that it was kelly mm-hmm. i don't know if that's true or not but assume that it was why did she take it because she hates wit no yeah, pro- probably <laughs> not or she just loves to steal well, maybe but more likely it's because she's homeless she's living by herself and she needs 65 dollars to you know get through life or to or to replace a, a frying pan that yeah. she needs to you know really buy for nice her mom frying pan. yeah yeah so so as as a whole now with what we've gotten for about kelly from this episode how do you feel about arthur about the overall depiction of of kelly did it ring true were there things that you yeah that i we kind of have an idea from the conversation so far, but I just kind of wondered what your, I don't know, kind of closing thoughts, at least for this chapter of her. Were. Yeah, I, I, I thought they they nailed it really well. Like I said said earlier, when I was listening to the episode, I thought whoever wrote this, I think has has experience in this. And uh, um, my wife and I are foster parents ourselves, and we've had uh, several kids in and, in and out of our home. So I'm not making any statements about any uh, specific kid, but just rather you know, kind of looking at the overall experience of being a foster parent, I can say, yeah, like I, I see Kelly as a legitimate, um, kid from, from hard place. She's not, she's not a foster kid, but she, you know, parents are, are divorced. She's kicked out of her house. Who knows, you know, apparently there's abuse and and probably a lot of other things we don't know. And it, it translated very well. 
for me. I thought, I, I, yeah, I thought they created a character that is consistent with what you would see in real life. Yeah, I, from my, yeah, much broader Which perspective from a- on this, I, I agree. Like I was, yeah, blown away with. The, yeah, just the way this episode is written, and um, yeah, she's a well fleshed out character, especially for someone who, yeah, was I mean the focus of, but this is like one episode into her story, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I feel like you set everything up really well to where I'm like I like understand not just superficially, but also like I feel like I have a deep a, a deeper understanding of who she is and what her motivations are mm-hmm. to the fact that we can have conversations like this about yeah about her as a character which i yeah, i don't think is, is always the case on odyssey when they introduce new characters which is so impressive and she's yeah, multi-dimensional yeah there's there's breadcrumbs of like intentional character development everywhere whether it's like the payphone like that answering machine machine stuff or her offering to pay for the pan or, um, you know, her offering advice to Mr. Washington, like, there's, yeah, clearly somebody knew what it was going to take to make a normal episode of Odyssey, and they knew that this couldn't be that, so they went a little bit harder and (laughs) fleshed it out, and I, yeah, you know, round of applause for them, They they did a great job. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. As much as one can love an incredibly sad episode yeah. of Foster Child. Yeah. It was it was deep. It was it was intense to listen to, but but I loved it. Mm. All right. Well, anybody else got closing thoughts before we wrap things up? I feel like I've I've said my piece. Yeah. Darth right. Kelly I'm, coming soon. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to <laughs> to seeing uh Darth Darth Kelly uh take over in, in episode two. I hope that happens. <laughs> Um, and then uh, Arthur is our guest on this episode. Is there anything you would like to plug or promote? We will have links in the in our show notes for for whatever. But are there places people can follow you or resources you'd like to direct them towards? Uh, sure. Well, there's a couple a, a couple I, I would mention if if anyone listening is is uh, um, a a parent of a foster or adopted child. Uh, my wife and I do a a podcast uh, called Trusting the God of the Gospel. And uh, uh, you can get more information about that at, at just uh, trustingthegodofthegospel.com or, you know, search it up on uh, iTunes or wherever you listen to, uh, to podcasts. And then if um, uh, you want more information specifically about me, uh, if you're looking to bring a speaker and teacher in for uh, uh, your organization's next event, you can find me at arthurcwoods.com, arthurcwoods.com. And then uh, all my socials are are Arthur C. Woods as well. Fantastic. Um, So that is uh, part one of The Chosen One. And we will be back next week, all three of us, to talk about uh, part two. Um, So see you then. Bye, guys. Bye. See ya. WattFam Chalkpod is a presentation of the Lidditz Podcast Co-op. This show is a fan podcast and has no official affiliation with Adventures in Odyssey or Focus on the Family. As such, the copyright is ours under Creative Commons. Follow the podcast at WadFamChalkPod on Twitter and Instagram, or email us at WadFamChalkPod at gmail.com. The Chosen One, Part 1, was hosted by Dylan Weaver and Andrew Acebo, with special guest Arthur C. Woods. It was edited by Dylan Weaver, and I'm Nathan Haverstick. Hoping you'll join us again next time for more of the Wad Fan Chalk Pod.